Good day, everyone. I'm going to be talking to you about echocardiography in heart failure, LVAD, and transplantation. So why do we offer people an LVAD? Well, the wait times for cardiac transplantation are very long. Large numbers of patients uh, exist with end-stage heart failure. The one-year survival on LVAD support is improving and uh, in those awaiting transplant, it is between 55 and 85%. More than 30,000 LVADs are implanted worldwide. Here you can see the different types of LVADs, the HeartMate 2, the HeartMate 3, and the Hardware LVADs. These are the most common L LVADs in North America. What are the clinical indications of these LVADs? Well, one is bridge to transplantation. The duration of support here in this case can be anywhere between six to 12 months. It max, these maximize survival until transplant. Number two is for destination therapy. The duration of support here is indefinite and the purpose is to maximize functional capacity and quality of life. One year survival uh, in these patients is approaching 80%. Number three is for myocardial recovery, which is something that we all hope for, and potential explantation of the LVAD. And the purpose of the LVAD here is to maximize LV reverse remodeling. So just to remind you of the LVAD circuit, remember that the, this is a heart made to LVAD, and the LVAD removes blood from the LV apex, as you can see here, and returns blood via the graft to the ascending aorta. There are three main internal components for the LVAD. There's the inflow cannula at the LV apex, the mechanical impeller, the outflow graph, which is connected to the ascending aorta. Now, LVADs are not available at every institution. I find this demonstration here uh, helpful for your understanding of how an LVAD works. This is a heart made to LVAD. You can see that it is uh, subdiaphragmatic with the inflow cannula here, the axial pump here, and the outflow graft anastomosing to the ascending aorta here. This is the heart hardware LVAD, also called the HVAD. And you can see that this one is an intrathoracic LVAD with the uh, outflow graft here and anastomosing to the ascending aorta here. So blood goes from the LV cavity in through the inflow cannula towards the outflow graft and into the ascending aorta. The purpose of the LVAD is to give the left ventricle a more normal shape. So this is actually a patient pre-LVAD placement. This is the endocardial surface of the left ventricle before LVAD placement. After LVAD placement, the LV is afterload reduced and it looks more bullet shaped as you can see in this here. This is just a schematic to show you what happens pre and post LVAD placement. This is a diagram showing the right atrium, the right ventricle, left atrium, left ventricle. Here's the aorta, the main pulmonary artery, and here the SVC, IVC. So initially, before the LVAD goes in, the patient is an end-stage heart failure. There's a low cardiac output. There's increased LV and diastolic pressure, increased left atrial pressure, increased pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, increased right atrial pressure, increased CVP and increased IVC pressure as well. When the LVAD is placed, as we said before, the inflow cannula goes into the left ventricle and the outflow cannula, and astomosis with the ascending aorta. And the LVAD results in increase in cardiac output and in so doing, decrease in pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, decrease in left atrial pressure, decrease in LV EVP. But one of the things that occurs with the LVAD when it's first placed is by increasing the cardiac output, it increases the preload to the right ventricle. And initially, you may see an increase in CVP and increase in right atrial pressures as the right ventricle starts to accommodate to the LVAD. Whether or not the right ventricle can accommodate the LVAD depends very much on uh, uh, some factors intrinsic to the right ventricle and, uh, and other factors. 
So when do we do echocardiography in these patients? Well, these are some of the clinical indications. One is for surveillance to basically to, to catch any drift from baseline echocardiogram. Two is to determine the optimal device setting with or without speed changes. Three is to assess any complications such as thrombosis, inflow, outflow, cannula, obstruction. And four is to assess any LV recovery. So let's look at the echo in an LVAD patient. The very first screen should tell you the type of LVAD, whether it's a heart rate two, an HVAD, or so forth. It should tell you the RPMs of the LVAD, and it should give you some preliminary parameters. For the LVAD evaluation, you want to know LV size, that is the LV end diastolic and end systolic dimensions. You want to know about aortic valve opening, aortic insufficiency, and we'll talk more about these things in the, in the coming slides. You want to know about interventricular septal position. You want to know about right ventricle size and function, mitral regurgitation. You want to know about the inflow cannula, the outflow cannula, any thrombosis that might be present, and you want to know about the pericardial set. These are some images from a patient uh, who is having a surveillance echo. You get the uh, LV size and function parameters from the parasternal long axis view. This person has a very enlarged left ventricular end diastolic dimension. You obtain aortic valve opening also from a zoomed view of the aortic valve. This uh, can be obtained from 2D, as you can see here. And uh, in order to uh, maximize your uh, assessment of the aortic valve, it is a good idea to obtain at least three beats uh, on 2D imaging of the aortic valve. And then also assess uh, aortic valve opening on M mode. This is also very useful. It can be done both in the parasternal long axis view or in the long axis view of the aortic valve and also in the short axis view of the aortic valve. Sometimes it's very useful when the patient has a bioprosthesis. It makes aortic valve opening easier to see. Aortic regurgitation is also assessed from the parasternal uh, long axis view. And uh, once again, zoomed on the aortic valve with color. What is important here is that aortic regurgitation um, uh, in LVAD patients can be continuous. And uh, the measurements that we use conventionally for aortic regurgitation assessment are not necessarily reliable in these patients. You also need to assess mitral regurgitation. You need to assess the interventricular septal position, and that is done in the apical four chamber view. And then the inflow cannula and the outflow cannula assessment. And these are CW Doppler velocities through both, which are important, we'll talk about that. And then the pericardial sac. So let's talk a little bit about the interventricular septum and the left ventricular size. So here are three different patients. You can see that the interventricular septal position differs uh, significantly between these three patients. This is a rightward shift in the interventricular septum. In this patient, there is inefficient left ventricular unloading. And here, uh, uh, you need to think about why that might be happening. Here is a midline interventricular septum. This is efficient LV compression. And here is a leftward shift in the interventricular septum, showing you that the left ventricle here is markedly unloaded. When you see a decrease in LV size with the interventricular septum shifted towards the left, as you saw on the far right-hand side of the previous slide, you need to think about things like hypovolemia, is the patient dehydrated? Are they having diarrhea, vomiting? Uh, are they not eating, drinking? These kinds of things can cause a uh, decrease in preload and uh, can cause the interventricular septum to shift towards the left because the LVAD remains at the same speed. Normally we would adjust our cardiac output, but uh, the patient being totally dependent or um, mostly dependent on the LVAD and this, because the speed cannot be changed unless the patient actually sees their physician, uh, there is a large impact uh, on the left ventricle with all these hemodynamic uh, changes. Uh, you, you can also, uh, so you can also, you should also suspect the presence of suction events. If you see a decreased left ventricular size, 
with the interventricular septum shifted towards the left, and also right heart failure. In these cases, the RV is usually dilated. If you see an increased LV size with the interventricular septum shifted towards the right, think about inflow cannula obstruction. Outflow cannula obstruction will give you examples of these. Think about significant aortic regurgitation and think about the presence of thrombus. In these cases, inflow cannula obstruction, outflow cannula obstruction, and thrombus, you may see increased aortic valve opening because the aortic, the left ventricle, the heart is no longer depending on the LVAD because something is uh, obstructing or, uh, or reducing the ability of the LVAD to work. And that is when the native heart takes over if there is any native uh, heart function and you will see increased aortic valve opening in these cases. So let's talk a little bit about thrombosis. Now thrombosis in patients with LVADs can happen anywhere. Here's an example of an aortic root thrombus. You can see it on the parasternal long axis. Right? This is a close-up of it. You can see it on the short axis as well. There's the thrombus. And then you can also see it with contrast echocardiography. This is a 50-year-old man who was one month status post heart made to LVAD. He was ready to go home after a lengthy admission. And this echo was actually done prior to discharge. Now, what this echo actually shows us is it is very important to, even if the echo uh, looks like it's of poor quality, to take all your images because you never know what you're going to find. And that is exactly what the sonographer did here. You can see the parasternal long axis view as expected in these patients who have uh, recent post-op LVADs, the image quality can be poor. Uh, however, we can tell that the left ventricle we could measure the left ventricular dimension if we had to here. We can see the mitral valve as well. In the uh, apical four chamber view, uh, you can see that the uh, interventricular septum looks midline. But in the apical five chamber view, you notice this uh, echo, uh, lucent, uh, very mobile uh, density here in the LV alpha tract. So this patient went on to have a TEE. And you can see that echo density under the anterior leaflet here. It is bright at the edges and loosened in the center, very suggestive of fresh thrombus. You can see it also here, and you can see it here where it actually closes over the LV outflow tract. And you can see it in, underneath the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve covering the LV outflow tract uh, in the 3D image. This is actually looking at the mitral valve from the left ventricular perspective. Let's talk a little bit about aortic valve opening. So this is aortic valve opening on 2D echocardiography. As I mentioned before, it is a good idea to zoom into the aortic valve to, uh, and to watch the aortic valve over at least 10 or so cardiac cycles. This is an example of a closed aortic valve. This is an example of an aortic valve that is intermittently opening. This is an example of an aortic valve that is opening normally. You can see the same thing with M-mode echocardiography. This is a closed aortic valve. You can see how clearly that uh, it shows up. You can see here an intermittently opening aortic valve with reduced excursion. You can see here an aortic valve opening every week. So what is the impact of aortic valve opening? If you look at this graph here, if you have a closed aortic valve, then uh, there is a greater likelihood of developing aortic regurgitation in the months following LVAD placement. So your freedom from aortic regurgitation is less if your aortic valve is closed. However, if you have an open or intermittently opening aortic valve, uh, you have more freedom from aortic regurgitation. Remember that aortic regurgitation in an LVAD patient is, does not have a good prognosis. It changes the hemodynamics and uh, it, uh, it actually uh, de decreases the, uh, the, uh, the prognosis for the patient. And we'll show a little bit more about that in the coming slides. For aortic insufficiency, as I mentioned before, you can see here, uh, the aortic insufficiency is often continuous. So it occurs during both systole and diastole, uh, continuous and not only during diastole. And this is a very good example here. The overall volume load that the ventricle actually sees is greater because of continuous aortic regurgitation. 
and it is often eccentric and poorly measured by the traditional echocardiographic measures such as vena contracta and PISA. These tend to underestimate the severity of aortic regurgitation, especially because it's continuous. So in terms of the time course of aortic insufficiency, uh, here on the y-axis, you can see freedom from increased uh, aortic insufficiency, and then uh, over time. So uh, over time, this is uh, 237 patients with a heart made to LVAD, and uh, you can see that over time, freedom from aortic regurgitation decreases. So the tendency is for aortic regurgitation to uh, to happen over time. And this is actually over years. So patients with LVADs tend to develop aortic regurgitation uh, given enough time. So in terms of the histopathological changes leading to aortic regurgitation, and remember these changes are more common in those people with closed aortic valves. They get increased local fibrosis, thrombus formation. They get aortic root remodeling and dilation. They get aortic valve degeneration and remodeling. They get common show of fusion and they get leaf gut valve rotation. And this is an example of a patient here with an LVAD. You can see how distorted the aortic uh, valve appears. And uh, this is actually a closed aortic valve. And over time, you can imagine that uh, the aortic valve gets uh, destroyed, commercial fusion, degeneration, remodeling, and so forth. So let's talk now a little bit about the inflow cannula. So these are some of the problems that can happen with inflow cannulas. You can have malposition, you can have occlusion, you can have thrombosis. It is very important to interrogate the inflow cannula. This is actually an example on transesophageal echocardiography. The inflow cannula is usually positioned at the LV apex and oriented with the uh, with the cannula pointing towards the mitral valve. This is the normal orientation of the uh, inflow cannula. And when it's orientated like this, this is the perfect uh, alignment with the uh, CW Doppler, um, uh, the CW Doppler beam, and uh, you can obtain a uh, jet or a, a CW Doppler profile and measure the maximum velocity through that inflow or through the inflow cannula. So one of the things about transesophageal echo, when the inflow cannula is positioned just right, the midesophageal four-chamber view is a good place to obtain the, uh, the uh, CW Doppler tracing through the inflow cannula. However, in, par in the parasternal long axis view, sometimes it can be difficult, or uh, in the transthoracic uh, echocardiography, it can sometimes be difficult to obtain the uh, inflow cannula in the correct position so that a good CW Doppler tracing can be um, can be obtained. Uh, sometimes it requires maneuvering from the short axis perspective to get that cannula in good alignment with the CW Doppler beam. So the abnormal inflow cannula. Mechanisms of inflow cannula obstruction include thrombus formation, inlet occlusion by trabeculations, cannula angulation into the myocardium, I'll show you that and then malposition due to underfilling of the, L, of the LV cavity, and I'll show you that as well. So here's an example of a cannula that is not positioned so that it's pointing towards the mitral valve. In fact, it is not positioned at the apex. It is actually pointing towards the septum. So this is not really where you want the uh, inflow cannula to be pointing. This is an exa another example of an inflow cannula that is pointing towards the wall of the ventricle here, not towards the mitral valve. So this is a 74-year-old female with an LVAD who complains of shortness of breath, fatigue, and exercise intolerance. So she comes into the emergency room and an echo is performed. You can see that her inflow cannula is actually pointing towards the septum. You can see that her LV cavity uh, is uh, small, 34 millimeters. So uh, uh, this patient is underfilled. The LV cavity is underfilled. You can see here, if you look very closely, that there is also a suction event with uh, the uh, cannula sucking on the myocardium because remember this cannula is active, right? The LVAD is on, it has a certain speed to it. And because there is shifting of the interventricular septum, and you can see it here towards the left because of the suctioning, because of the, uh, the uh, underfilled LV cavity, what happens is that the right ventricle dilates right atrium also dilates because that septum is pulled towards the left ventricle. 
And this is not a good thing because when the right ventricle dilates, the annulus gets bigger and you get significant recuspid regurgitation, which uh, uh, long term and even over the short term is not a good thing. These are other examples or in the same patient of how you can get suction events. Uh, you can see very clearly the, uh, the uh, infocannula is sucking on the myocardium there. And when you obtain a velocity through that infocannula, you got 3.6 meters per second, which is high. The normal velocities for infocannulas are around 2, 2.5, 3.6 is high. So let's talk now a lot about outflow cannulas. Uh, and some of the problems that can happen with outflow cannulas include kinks, obstruction, thrombosis. So first of all, the normal outflow cannula. So this is transthoracic echocardiography here. This is transesophageal echo. With transthoracic echocardiography, this is the, uh, uh, the right suprasternal, or uh, it can also be the high parasternal. Uh, you can see the ascending aorta here. You can see the sinus of Asava down here. And you can see the anastomosis of the outflow graph right here. You can appreciate it here again with color. And this is where the, the blood actually flows into the ascending aorta, which you can see very nicely here. And it's also very well aligned for the CW Doppler jet. And uh, here uh, we obtain the CW Doppler jet, and you can obtain a maximum velocity through the outflow camera here. This is a trans tra sorry, transesophageal echocardiography. And you can see here that the uh, outflow cannula has an astomosin with the ascending aorta here. And uh, this is also a perfect alignment for the CW Doppler velocity. And you can see the CW Doppler tracing obtained here. So typically, you can obtain these outflow cannula velocities in the right parasternal um, position. Sometimes uh, the patient, uh, it looks, it's easier to obtain when the patient is lying on their back. Sometimes a suprasternal needs to be used. So you need to uh, practice this in order to get, uh, in order to uh, be able to get this uh, window in these patients. Now the uh, alpha cannula peak velocities actually depend on LVAD type. So this is just a variety of LVADs. And uh, this is data from our echo lab showing that uh, the heart rate two uh, peak velocities cluster around one to three. The HVAD cluster around uh, one to three point five. The heart rate three clustered around one to uh, two point five. So really, uh, abnormal velocities tend to be two point five and above uh, or three uh, in our experience. So here's an example of a 61 year old man who status post heart rate two for ischemic cardiomyopathy. His peak outflow cannula velocity was uh, 3.9 meters per second on 13 day follow up uh, echo, 13 days after LVAD was placed. So here you can see his uh, outflow cannula. You can very nicely see the anastomosis of the graph with the ascending aorta here. And you can also appreciate that uh, there is turbulent flow here and the velocity was 3.9 meters per second. So we looked a little bit uh, more into this because the velocities were so high. And uh, you can see that there is probably a kink there, even on 2D echo. And with the CT, you can visualize this kink very clearly right there in the outflow canyon. So initially this patient did well and uh, they didn't really want to do anything about this, but uh, uh, a couple of years down the road, as the uh, LVAD and the graph got older, the patient started becoming more symptomatic and this was actually uh, replaced. Here's a 48 year old woman, status post hardware LVAD for ischemic cardiomyopathy as bridge to transplant. She was admitted for shortness of breath and chest pain. You can see her right heart cath numbers here. Wedge is high. You can see PA pressures are high. And here you can see again the outflow cannula anastomosis to the ascending aorta. There is turbulent flow here. And in fact, the uh, outflow cannula velocity was 3.4 meters per second, which is also high. And uh, when you look at the uh, sinus of Valsalva, you see this abnormal turbulence in the sinus. And this is also a clue that there is a uh, outflow cannula obstruction 
So this patient went to the cath lab and uh, they shot dye into the uh, aorta, as you can see here. And if you watch very closely at this aortogram, you cannot see the alpha cannula. So the alpha cannula does not light up. The graft itself does not light up, uh, does not take up the contrast, suggesting that it's completely occluded. So then they put a wire down into the outflow graft, as you can see here, and they actually ballooned it. And you can see it here showing up. And then they uh, stented the, uh, uh, the outflow graft. And if you look very closely, you can actually see the stent there between the yellow arrows. And then when they uh, did another aortogram, now you can see that the outflow graft is open. And post stent, you can actually see the stent in the uh, transthoracic echo. It looks a little scary. You can see the stent here, sticking to the ascending aorta here. And this is what the color looked like in the stent. Now let's move on to talk a little bit about LVAD speed optimization. So remember that in real life, when we lie down to go to sleep, when we walk, when we run, our cardiac output increases to accommodate what we want to do. But in these LVAD patients, they are totally dependent on the speed that they are set, the set, the set speed, set RPMs of the LVAD. That does not change. They cannot change it at home, but right? if they want to uh, increase their activity, they depend on that speed. So it's very important to set that speed to uh, give the patient the best quality of life that they can have. And this is where uh, the RAMP study comes in. The RAMP study is uh, a, uh, it's a study that we do with echocardiography. And uh, what we do is we increase the speed settings of the uh, LVAD and by set increments and obtain echo images at uh, set, uh, set increments as well uh, to optimize the function of the LVAD. And what do we mean by optimize the function of the LVAD? But in terms of echo, you want to make sure that the interventricular septum is midline so that the uh, LV is, uh, is efficiently offloaded. You want to make sure that uh, there is as little aortic regurgitation as possible. You want to make sure that the aortic valve is intermittently opening. You want to make sure that, um, that there's as little mitral regurgitation as, uh, as possible. And so these are the images that we actually take at specific intervals on the RAMP study. So this actually illustrates the uh, intervals, the RPM intervals that we use for the HeartMate 2 LVAD and for the uh, HVAD in blue. That is uh, one of our sonographers taking images, in this case in the cath lab, because we also did some of these RAM studies with hemodynamics at the same time. And, uh, they, uh, and then once the RAM study is over and they decide which speed they want to set the LVAD to, the LVAD is speed is changed to that. The RAM study is stopped if there are any suction events and if the end start diameter of the LV reaches less than three uh, centimeters. Of course, before starting the RAM study, we need to make sure that the INR is more than 1.8, PTT greater than 60, that there's no LV thrombus and no aortic root thrombus. And no thrombus anyway. So as I mentioned before, the purpose is to optimize device speed without compromising cardiac function. You want to make sure that the mean arterial blood pressure is, around, is greater than 65, that the interventricular septum is maintained in the midline position, that there's intermittent aortic valve opening, no more than mild mitral regurgitation. And you can also use the RAMP study to evaluate for LVAD malfunction. We have done that a couple of times. So in terms of the RAMP test protocol, here are the speeds that you uh, could potentially use for the heart rate 2 LVAD, for instance. Uh, you record at each speed setting the LVAD parameters, the patient parameters, and then the echo parameters. And these are the echo parameters that we talked about in the previous slide. So with increasing LVAD pump speed, as expected, the LV cavity should decrease. So you can see here, this is the same patient. All these images are taken in the same patient. And you can see that uh, at 800 RPMs, the uh, LV cavity measures at 74 millimeters. And then at 10,400 RPMs, 
the LV cavity measures at 63 millimeters. So it has decreased from here to here by about 10 millimeters, a little more than 10 millimeters. Now, as you go to the high speed, you expect that the uh, interventricular septum is going to shift towards the LV. And remember, we mentioned before that when that happens, uh, at the extremes of speed, as you can see here, initially, uh, the RV also uh, compensates for that, and, uh, and uh, you don't see uh, much of a change in the right ventricle. But eventually, when the speeds get very high and the, uh, the septum is shifted leftward, the RV starts to uh, show dilation. You may even get tricuspid regurgitation, and you know that you don't want to set the patient's speed at this level. So with increasing LVAD speed, uh, aortic, the aortic valve closes. And that is because of the pressure differential across the aortic valve with uh, increasing speeds. So you can see here at 800 RPMs, you can see the aortic valve is opening. If you watch carefully, you can also see the aortic valve opening here. And then at the highest speed here, the aortic valve is closed. So as we said before, we want to maintain intermittent aortic valve opening. Uh, and so you don't want to set the pump speed at this point. You don't want to leave the pump speed here at the lowest level. With increasing LVAD pump speed, aortic regurgitation increases. That is also because of the differential pressure across the aortic valve with increasing speeds. You can see here that you already have at least mild aortic regurgitation. That becomes uh, perhaps moderate aortic regurgitation here because it's continuous. And then uh, there's significant aortic regurgitation here at the higher speed. With increasing LVAD speed, mitral regurgitation gets better, right? Because the wedge pressure goes down. Uh, and uh, as we said before, the uh, mitral regurgitation therefore improves. And you can see here significant mitral regurgitation, which goes down here, and almost no mitral regurgitation here at the highest speed. So this, and I'll wait for a second so that it can uh, all play on uh, your recording. This is an example of a RAMP study. Okay, so let me just take you through this. This is in a, in a single patient. This is the 800, the lowest speed. Again, it's a heart rate too. 8,800, 9,600, 10,400, 11,600. And you can see that the LV end diastolic dimension decreases with increasing speeds. And you can see that aortic regurgitation, as we talked about, increases with increasing speed. Mitral regurgitation decreases with increasing speed. And the aortic valve closure, um, the aortic valve remains closed for uh, a longer period of time uh, with increasing speeds. Now, one of the things that I did not mention before is that when we assess aortic valve closure, one way of assessing it is to assess it over 10 beats and to, to uh, say that the aortic valve is open three out of 10 beats, for instance. So that will be 30% of the time. And that's how we did it over here. You can see that the aortic valve opening here was 100% uh, with every beat, and then slowly 30% and then closed. So you don't really want to set the speed here because the aortic valve is closed. And that's bad because the patient has a lot of aortic regurgitation here. You don't want to set the speed here because the, the LV is not sufficiently uh, offloaded here. Finally, in these two settings, you are getting some effect of the LVAD. So the decision has to be made where here is the uh, is it best to set the uh, LVAD speed and might even be in the middle of these two. Now in this patient, we happen to have uh, hemodynamic data available as well. And uh, so that gave us added information. With increasing LVAD speed, you can see that the uh, CVP decreases you can see that the pulmonary artery pressure, um, mean pulmonary pressure decreases, the wedge pressure decreases, the PA sat decreases, the cardiac output increases. And so if you match that up with what's happening in echo, uh, in the cath lab, we came to the conclusion to set the LVAD speed somewhere at 9600, a little bit above that. So in order to assess the uh, LVAD, first you have to assess the inflow cannula. Uh, 
for malposition, occlusion, malfunction, thrombosis. You need to assess the mitral valve for any regurgitation, thrombosis. You need to assess aortic valve opening, regurgitation, thrombosis. You need to assess the outflow cannula for kink, obstruction, thrombosis. You need to assess the pericardium for any effusion, tamponade, hemorrhage, especially in the post-op setting. You need to assess the septum for malposition, for LV dimension. And you need to assess the right ventricle for failure, tricuspid regurgitation, thrombosis. So let's do one case, uh, an LVAD malfunction case. This was a 50-year-old female uh, with a history of idiopathic cardiomyopathy who had a heartmate two placed about six months ago. She had a two-day history of shortness of breath and fatigue. Her lab values were consistent with hemolysis. And uh, you can see that her x-ray shows pulmonary edema. There's her uh, heart rate 2 LVAD, which is subdiaphragmatic, and she has an ICD as well. And uh, so in order to assess what was going on here, a RAM study was performed. Now there's already a clue in the hemolysis. Remember that uh, with normal LVAD function, the uh, size of the left ventricle decreases with increasing speed, the aortic valve uh, closes at higher speeds, there's increasing aortic regurgitation, decreasing mitral regurgitation, and the shift of the interventricular septum to the left. So what happened in our patient? So we increased the speeds all the way to 11,200 in this case, and the uh, LV uh, dimension did not change. The aortic valve opening also did not change. And this patient actually had a thrombus in the inlet stator. So you consider you should consider LVAD thrombosis in those patients with worsening heart failure, with signs of hemolysis such as a low haptoglobin elevated LDH, with a device malfunction. So these patients and this patient also had it, do have alarms flow alarms that occur on their LVAD that alert them to something I'm not, something going wrong with their LVAD. And that's why they call the uh, LVAD coordinator and, uh, and are, uh, sometimes are told to come into the hospital if it's not something that can be resolved over the phone. Uh, and then uh, an echo RAM test can help, uh, in, as in this case, uh, demonstrate uh, the chain, no change in LV and diastolic dimension with increasing LVAD speeds. Let's now move on to talk about echocardiography post heart transplantation. So heart transplantation is a life-saving option for patients with end-stage heart failure. The first human-to-human -human heart transplant was performed in 1967 in Cape Town, South Africa. It took nine hours with a team of 30 people. Today, there are two main approaches to heart transplantation that you may see on echocardiography. The biatrial approach is the older approach, and it has now been replaced by the second approach, which is the bicaval approach. So let's talk about these two approaches to heart transplantation, as they will help you understand what you are looking at when you see a transplant patient on echocardiography. So in A, we show the biatrial transplant. In B, the bicaval or more, and more common type of transplant uh, operation. This uh, information comes from the European Heart Journal Cardiovascular Imaging uh, 2015 manuscript. So in biatrial, uh, in the biatrial uh, operation, there is an anastomosis made at the mid-level of the left and right atrium, and the aortic and PA anastomosis occur above the semilunar valves. The appendages are removed. The right atrial incision is close to the donor SA node, Necrosis of the SA node and sinoatrial node dysfunction can happen in this type of surgery. Atrial geometry is distorted, resulting in enlarged atria, and large parts of the recipient atria are re retained in this type of operation. Now, as I said before, the biatrial operation is largely replaced by the bicaval operation, which is shown in B. This is the most common, and uh, here the donor heart is connected through bicaval anastomosis. The left atrial incision is carried to the base of the left atrial appendage, which is removed, leaving a small margin of the atrial cuff around the four pulmonary veins. There is better preservation 
of the anatomic configuration of the heart and a decreased need for prominent pacemaker and improved survival in these patients. Now, the very last operation that I show you here is in C, and that is called the complete atrioventricular cardiac transplantation. It has separate cable and pulmonary vein anastomosis, as you can see, but this has a lot of technical issues and is not used anymore. And uh, here you can have bleeding from the suture lines of the pulmonary veins, reduced patency of the pulmonary veins due to twisting and stenosis and anastomo or at the anastomosis sites. And uh, with this increased complica complication rates, this type of surgery is not used any longer. So here on the left is an example of the biatrial transplant uh, heart. And then on the right, the bicable, more, common, uh, more commonly used operation now, the bicable transplant. So where does transthoracic echo fit in, the, in heart transplant patients? Well, it can be used in the post-op period to identify surgical complications and early allograft dysfunction. And then depending on the institution, it is often ordered every six to 12 months after heart transplantation. And it's also used after endomyocardial biopsy. One of the important things to note is that normal values derived from healthy subjects and published in the guidelines, such as the chamber quantification guidelines, do not apply to this population. And the reason for that is that thoracic surgery, the pericardiotomy influence, of, influence the contractility and the motion of the heart and uh, also result in altered ventricular interdependence. So this changes uh, the way the heart works and the, many of the normal values that are applicable to uh, native hearts are not quite ap applicable to these heart transplant patients. And we'll talk about that in the coming slides. Also, the function of the donor heart may be affected by the cause of donor death. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as well and procedures related to explantation, storage of the heart and implantation in the recipient. So let's first talk about the left ventricle on transthoracic echo following heart transplantation. First thing, let's talk about the wall thickness. The wall thickness, as you can see in the right uh, upper image there, can be increased in the first month due to inflammatory cell infiltration and edema. And this usually resolves after three months. Beyond three months, uh, increased wall thickness in these heart transplant patients can be due to many factors, and we will go over that in the coming slides. Dimensions in these patients of the LV cavity are usually normal. End diastolic volume tends to be smaller. Ejection fraction tends to be more reduced uh, than in the, um, in the native heart patients. Strain also tends to be reduced in this population compared to uh, native hearts. This is just a diagram showing you what happens uh, to a longitudinal strain, for instance. The top portion refers to a normal heart and the bottom portion refers to a transplanted heart. And you can see, for instance, that longitudinal uh, deformation decreases in these, in these patients. So why do we have increased wall thickness in heart transplant recipients? Well, one of the things that happens is that uh, these patients can get persistent tachycardia due to the vagal denervation that occurs with transplant. And uh, they also can have renal impairment that can impair wall thickness, systemic hypertension, the donor health in terms of, uh, for instance, if the donor had intracranial hemorrhage and that was responsible for donor death, that can result in LVH in the donor heart and therefore in the recipient heart. Also side effects of immunosuppressive treatments. Many are associated with hypertension and therefore with LVH. And remember that the types of immunosuppressive treatments that these patients are on includes steroids, cyclosporin, tacro, azathioprine, and so forth. Also, if there's a donor recipient heart size mismatch, LVH can be a compensatory mechanism in the recipient to maintain stroke volume. And uh, repeated episodes of rejection can also result in increased wall thickness in heart transplant recipients. Any sudden increase in uh, wall thickness warrants investigation and should raise the suspicion of acute graft rejection in these patients. What about the right ventricle on transthoracic echo? 
after heart transplantation. Well, we know that the right ventricle is very sensitive to pressure and volume overload. There's a close relationship between size of the right ventricle and function of the right ventricle. And it is affected by duration of hypothermic arrest, method of allograft preparation, ischemic time, and also mechanism of donor death. The size of the right ventricle is greater than the reference values on the chamber quantification guidelines. The function is reduced in the heart, in the transplanted heart. Chamber size often normalizes after heart transplantation, but the longitudinal function of the heart uh, of the right ventricle partially recovers in about two thirds of patients within one year. And here I have a set of normal values on the right and these come from a recently published paper in JACE in 2018 in a population of heart transplant patients. You can see that they found TAPC was about 15 plus or minus four, fractional area change about 40 plus or minus eight, free wall longitudinal strain of the RV minus 17 uh, plus or minus four, RV GLS also reduced compared to the normal population at minus 15 plus or minus four, and 3D RV ejection fraction has also um, being shown to be reduced in these patients. This is an example of a heart transplant patient from our center. You can see that uh, this patient uh, is uh, uh, three months after heart transplantation. The right ventricle does look dilated. CAPC is 1.5 millimeters, fractional area change 34%, and uh, the RV pre wall strain minus 19%. What about the left atrium on transthoracic echo after heart transplantation? Well, larger left atrial dimensions are seen uh, in heart transplant patients. Recipients of bicable transplants had smaller uh, a a left atrial volumes than those who received biatrial transplants. This is an example here of a recipient of a biatrial transplant on the left and uh, a bicable transplant on the right. And you can see just by looking at the atria, that they are bigger in the biatrial transplant patient. What about diastolic dysfunction in the transplanted heart? Well, diastolic dysfunction can be difficult to diagnose. One of the reasons is that denervation of the donor heart leads to sinus tachycardia, which in turn leads to fusion of mitral ENA velocities. The biatrial technique often leads to two intact sinoatrial nodes beating at different rates the donor and the remaining right atrial tissue from the recipient. And that can affect mitral inflow causing lead to beat variability in ENA velocities. Atrial function can also be impaired because of the mid atrial anastomosis between donor and recipient hearts. The bicable surgery technique may not affect atrial function as much as in the biatrial technique. Well, more on diastolic dysfunction in the transplanted heart. E over A can have a restrictive appearing filling pattern in patients with preserved ejection fraction. Uh, and uh, this is a common finding seen uh, in these heart transplant patients, mainly because uh, the donor hearts are usually obtained from healthy young people, and uh, these people have normal LV diastolic function. Later on in life, uh, progressive myocardial fibrosis, for instance, in cardiac allograft vasculopathy, which we'll talk about in the coming slides, can lead to a restrictive filling pattern. Tissue Doppler E prime is influenced by tr translational motion of the heart. Early after transplantation, myocardial tissue velocities are low and recover gradually. They remain lower than the general population even after one year, according to some studies. 
Studies evaluating conventional diastolic function have failed to find any single parameter that correctly diagnoses diastolic dysfunction in these patients. This is an example of a uh, patient three months post heart transplantation. You can see the increased LVH with increased LV wall thickness. You can see the ENA fusion. You can see uh, both E prime, medial, and lateral are reduced uh, in this particular patient with an E prime medial of 4.6 and an E prime lateral of 5.3. Heart transplant rejection is the leading cause of mortality and graft loss in these patients. Unlike in kidney and liver transplantation, there are no biomarkers to detect heart transplant rejection. And there are two types of rejection. One is acute rejection, which is also called acute cellular rejection or ACR, and then chronic rejection, which often manifests as cardiac allograft vasculopathy. In acute rejection or ACR, Usually, this occurs within the first month, six months, but it can happen at any time. It is a T-cell mediated inflammatory response leading to myocardial edema and myocyte damage. Routine surveillance performed with endomyocardial biopsy, the histological interpretation of this is often subjective, and biopsy samples are taken from the interventricular septum. There's a 6% complication rate including risk of right bundle branch block, tricuspid regurgitation, and RV perforation. So this is an example of a patient who was post endomyocardial biopsy. If you can look at the top uh, right hand corner, you can see in the RV inflow view that there's a very eccentric jet of tricuspid regurgitation. If you look very closely at the view, the RV inflow view without color, you can see uh, a small piece of the leaflet pointing towards the right atrium. And that is actually a uh, flail leaflet. You can appreciate that eccentric TR jet again in the left um, bottom image. You can see the in the uh, apical four chamber view, uh, right, focused on the right ventricle. You can see that eccentric TR jet um, in that image as well. If you look at the 3D images, on the top right, you are looking at the tricuspid valve from the right ventricular perspective on the left-hand side, and from the right atrial perspective on the right-hand side. On the bottom right, you're looking at the tricuspid valve from the right atrial perspective. If you look very carefully in the region of the septal leaflet, you can see that there is a flail of uh, the septal leaflet. It's not very easy to pick up in this case because it was a small flail and uh, this patient actually has done well uh, and has not needed any further intervention. So this is a schematic showing different non-invasive imaging techniques performed at various stages of cardiac involvement uh, due to acute cellular rejection. You can see that echocardiography comes in pretty late at the bottom in detecting cardiac allograft uh, rejection by uh, change in diastolic or by presence of diastolic dysfunction or systolic dysfunction. And uh, orange stars refer to those that examinations that are clinically acceptable and uh, brown stars refer to those that are investigational. So you can see that most of our clinically accepted um, techniques are only able to pick up rejection late in the process. So we do need something to be able to pick up non-invasively rejection earlier in the process. Chronic rejection or CAV manifests as ca cardiac allograft vasculopathy. It can develop as early as one year after transplant. Any, it's an immunological response against the vascular endothelium of the allograft. It's reported to occur in 20% after three years, 30% at five years, and up to 50% after 10 years. Existing methods for monitoring the cardiac allograft involve intracoronary angiography. So you can see that there is a need for non-invasive approach to detect uh, rejection early, uh, also with chronic rejection. This is the schematic showing the different non-invasive imaging and invasive techniques that can be performed at various stages of cardiac involvement to detect cardiac allograft vasculopathy. And once again, echocardiography comes in very late in the process 
uh, helping to identify diastolic dysfunction or systolic dysfunction in these patients. So how do we detect rejection with LV ejection fraction? One of the problems with LV ejection fraction is that it's often preserved until late in the process. Decreased LV ejection fraction in the first year after transplant is a predictor for the development of acute rejection or CAV. It has low sensitivity for acute rejection, however, and there's no correlation between the magnitude of LV ejection fraction decline and rejection grade on biopsy. Reduction in LV ejection fraction late after cardiac transplantation correlates with CAV progression. Regional wall motion abnormalities are prognostic in these patients. What about diastolic dysfunction? Well, we know that diastolic changes occur before systolic abnormalities in acute rejection. Edema, immune-mediated expansion of the extracellular space, interstitial fibrosis, all impair ventricular relaxation. E, A, E over A, and uh, isovolumetric relaxation time have limited ability to detect acute rejection as they are affected by other factors, such as higher resting heart rate, where the E and A merge, altered uh, arterial, uh, atrial morphology, preload, and donor age. Myocardial fibrosis, chronic graft rejection, leads to restrictive LV filling and decreased annular velocities or E-prime velocities. What about strain or deformation analysis? Well, we know that echocardiography is insensitive for detecting acute cellular rejection because the filling abnormalities that we have talked about so far are not seen in lower grades of rejection. Rejection is characterized by these cellular infiltrates and edema early on, which disrupts regional contractility. And left ventricular strain can look at regional, uh, there is such a thing as regional deformation analysis. But the reports on uh, L, use of LV strain in these patients in detection of allograft rejection are mixed at this time. So strain analysis cannot replace biopsy for rejection surveillance at this time. This is actually a prospective study that is suggesting that perhaps if we look at strain analysis in uh, both the right ventricle and the left ventricle, perhaps that could be a stronger predictor of uh, acute cellular rejection. And they found an RV free wall strain of less than 17% and a global longitudinal strain of less than 15.5% um, magnitude uh, were independent predictors of acute cellular rejection. What about stress echocardiography? Well, Exercise stress echocardiography has a low sensitivity for detecting uh, CAV due to the inability of the denervated transplant heart to reach target heart rate with exercise. Dobutamine stress echo sensitivity uh, has a sensitivity of about 70 to 80% for detecting significant CAV, and the sensitivity falls for mild lesions. The main contribution of stress echocardiography is to assess prognosis in post-transplant patients. A negative dobutamine stress echo implies less than 3% risk of uh, MACE over one year. Other complications that you should know about post-transplantation is tricuspid regurgitation. Tricuspid regurgitation is actually the most common valve pathology after transplantation, and it is due to alteration in right atrial morphology in these patients that occurs after transplantation. It can be due to pulmonary hypertension that occurred in the recipient before transplantation. It can be due to RV enlargement and uh, endomyocardial biopsy injury, as we saw earlier. Other uh, less common complications include narrowing stenosis at the anastomosis sites, which can be SVC, IVC, aortic anastomosis, and the main PA. So in summary, the transplanted heart is unique. Guideline reference values do not apply in these patients, especially in the first year after transplant. Echocardiography is non-invasive, portable, easily accessible, and can be used to follow patients post-op and beyond. Serial echo showing no change from baseline have a high negative predictive value for acute cellular re rejection. And this is one of the reasons why many centers do serial echoes in these patients. However, echocardiography has low sensitivity less than equal to 50% for detection of acute rejection.
And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention.